Hey, good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Turn to the book of Daniel. We're walking through the book of Daniel this summer. It has been so good. Turn to Daniel chapter 4 is where we're going to be. We're about 580 B.C. Now let's place this in context. 600 B.C. And uh, from the outside looking in, the Jewish God is dead. Think about it. Jerusalem is no longer. The nation doesn't exist. The temple uh, is gone. And so in all practical purposes, uh, Judaism is finished. I mean, there's no true practice of Judaism anymore. The people are dispersed. Among them are Daniel and his friends. Now I say that because this is an interesting moment, historical moment in the life of the American church, or really the church globally, we've seen a major shift. We're forced to cancel our services so we can't go to the temple, right? We can't have midweek services. We can't go to conferences. We, we can't have our gatherings. And, and although those are great and wonderful things, perhaps this season has shown us how much we rely on uh, church culture, really. Kind of the gathering instead of, watch this, relying on our intimate walk with Jesus every day through prayer and through his word. What have you learned in this season? Perhaps some of us have discovered our faith is more reliant on events and programs and what we've made church out to be instead of an intimate pursuit of Jesus every single day. So how do you live out your faith when the structure of worship and organization of the church has been dispersed? How do you live far from Jerusalem? And does God even move in exile? And if so, how does he move? These are the questions that are answered in the book of Daniel. Why it's more relevant than today's news feed. These are the things that we're discovering in these days. So uh, what, what we've learned is this. Uh, when we have a, a, an exile go into secular culture, okay, so as exiles, we're living in this secular context. Where those two worlds converge is where the kingdom of God shows up. That's why God calls us out to live in a, a post-Christian, if you will, kind of a secular culture and be light and salt in the world in close proximity with all that's happening. It's at that intersection that, that takes place. But it's possible at the same time, to live in exile and, and to blend in with culture. It's what Paul says when he says in Romans 12, to conform to the world and not be transformed, to be different. And perhaps this is most true. We see it more clearly uh, with people who are in places of leadership, when exiles, if you will, find themselves in places of influence and leadership. This could be in our parenting, it could be in our the workplace or leading others. And what we do, we take on the practices and the, uh, the kind of patterns of those we see in influence around us. Where the leadership of Jesus, we know, is contrary to the kind of leadership that we see in the world. Let me ask you this. Why is it that so many leaders fall? Why do so many people in powerful positions become so arrogant? Are they that way before they got there? Why do so many people in places of leadership get off track? I think it's because we forget that leadership, like life, is a stewardship. It's temporary and we're accountable. And today we're going to see that God rules. Now I want you to be very encouraged by this story. He's sovereign over everything. God rules. And because he does, whatever you're going through, you can know, you can trust him. You can rest in him today. If we humble ourselves before him, he will lift us up. Okay, so let's go. Turn to Daniel 4 again. King Nebuchadnezzar is now an old man, so don't miss this. Uh, he's coming to the end of his reign, the end of his life. Daniel's going to outlive a few kings. So here he is. The king wants to tell a story. It literally is his testimony that he's gonna share here. Look at what it says, verse one, King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. He's literally the single monarch of the entire world, okay? The Babylonians, the Syrians rule. Look at verse two. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. Now, don't miss this. Nebuchadnezzar is often known as the villain in the story, right? And he has been that probably through chapters 1, 2, and 3. But here he is praising Yahweh at the end of his life. He has seen Daniel, 
okay, by the power of God, he proclaimed himself, interpret his dreams. He's watched Daniel's friends be rescued from the fiery furnace we looked at last week. And now he's going to share his own personal story of how God has changed his life. Look at verse 3. How great are his signs. How mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I mean, this sounds like David in the Psalms. Look at this. He goes on. Here's his testimony. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. All right, now, if anyone should be chilling at his house, at ease, resting, enjoying life, sleeping well, it should be Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, he's kind of the ultimate he-man. He's the master of the universe. He's arguably the greatest leader, one of the greatest leaders who's, who's ever lived. He built the most incredible city, many would say, that, that there's ever been in the world, proportionately larger than any city that we know of even today, larger than New York City. I mean, imagine this urban city, and yet it's green. It's like an urban garden. I mean, you probably have heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, 600 B.C., one of the uh, seven wonders of the world. We're still talking about it today. I mean, this was an incredible um, incredible empire that he built, and he is the man. Nebuchadnezzar experienced the kind of power and influence that only a few people in all of history have ever known. He had no reason to be worried or have any anxiety in his life. You may think uh, with, with, with that, you know, maybe people be coming after him. He's at the top. Everybody's coming after you if you're at the top. Maybe an army's coming after him. He'd be worried. What army? There are no armies. He's the monarch of the known world. So look at verse 5. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. Look at this. He's at the top of the world and he cannot sleep. He, he cannot find rest for his soul. He's remembering back, telling the story. And, and the dream that he has is so troubling he couldn't sleep. Now, verse 6, it says that he seeks out an interpreter. Of course, Daniel comes in, verse 9. King tells him his dream. He says, hey, what I saw was a giant tree so big and strong that it covered the earth. And all the inhabitants of the earth were under this tree. And then I saw, he says, a holy one, verse 13, come out of heaven. And he ordered the tree to be chopped down. And so there's this stump. And then this stump is tied up. And this stump is kind of personified, kind of strange. Stump becomes like a, like a beast. It's like a, like a man, but then he becomes like a beast, this stump does. And he's, this beast is going to eat from the grass of the earth. Uh, and it says after seven periods of time, verse 16. A lot of people think, well, that's seven years. Some say it's seven seasons. Could be a year and a half. I'm going to go with seven years. So then it says in verse 17, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision or the verdict by the word of the holy ones. And here it is. We see this over and over again throughout this passage. Don't miss this. To the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Again, this statement we're going to see over and over again. He's saying, the king, the king says, hey, Daniel, tell me what this means. And in verse 19, Daniel, it says he's dismayed. He's astonished. He's terrified. In fact, one translation says he goes white. Because he says then in verse 22, O king, you are the tree. You're going to be cut down. In verse 25, you're going to be driven out. And you're going to eat grass like an ox, he says. Okay, crazy stuff. Look at verse 25. We'll get to that. Until you know, here it is again. Until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. That's the message that he wants, the Lord wants Nebuchadnezzar to know and wants us to know today. Heaven rules. You need to learn. God puts leaders in place, and you included, until you recognize this, and, or you will prosper no more. Let's look at verse 27. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins. Now watch this. By practicing righteousness, and your iniquities by showing 
mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. He says, if you'll repent, this won't be the end of your story. But this thing sets up the whole story here. The king is given this truth and he must respond. But as we'll see, all of this will happen to him. We're going to watch it throughout this entire chapter. He has essentially, what I think what we would describe as a mental breakdown. He becomes like a wild beast of the field. But by the end of his life, he's actually praising God. By the end of this chapter, we're going to see he loses his mind. He suffers greatly, but he ends up praising Yahweh for what he's gone through. Because what he's saying here basically is there was something so insidious in me, so self-destructive, uh, that, that I had to get, out of, get, get rid of it, get it out of my soul, and it was worth losing everything to get this out of me. What was it? What is it that will kill us if we don't allow God to strip it away? from us is pride. It's spiritual pride. And before you think this is a crazy story about the greatest leader, one of the greatest leaders of all time, one of the most powerful men in the world, certainly at that time, let's look at our own hearts, lest we self-destruct. Could it be that we're troubled by the same things that Nebuchadnezzar was troubled by? Could it be that we can't find sleep or soulful rest for the same reasons that he couldn't. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to talk about the, the reality of pride. I want to talk about the result of pride. And I want to talk about the rescue from pride. Okay, the reality, the result, and the rescue. First, the reality of pride. We all wrestle with pride. In fact, the Bible teaches us that one of the signs of pride is that you think you don't struggle with pride. This story shows us that whatever you have Uh, Whatever position of power you may find yourself in, however much you might accomplish or think that you're so great or, or will become, you cannot find peace. It will never be enough. More will never be enough. It will never fill you up. And Nebuchadnezzar knew, listen, what very few people in the world ever come to know by experience. And that is they learn that the highest achievement cannot bring you peace. Here's what we see here. See, people at the top are very troubled people. And I don't mean they're all sinful, they're all ego, ego, egocentric. What I mean is they learn what the rest of us don't know. That when you reach the highest achievements in your life, when you are at the very top, there's something about the human soul It says it's still not enough. I've heard people say, hey, uh, you know, money can't buy happiness, but I would like to be able to prove that myself. Uh, No, you wouldn't. Nebuchadnezzar has proved it for us. Listen, Solomon has proven it for us. Go down the list. Howard Hughes proved it for us. Elvis, Marilyn Monroe, Michael Jackson. The human soul wants something bigger than the entire world. Success, achievement, pride cannot bring sleep. It cannot bring rest. But this sleeplessness, listen, is actually a mercy from God. This is what Nebuchadnezzar is going to teach us. Look back at the story, verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. All that was going to happen, and now it's going to be played out. Verse 29. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof. Now, this is before all this goes down. He's up in the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said... Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? Look at what he's saying. Spiritual pride says, I did this. This is by me and for me, is what he's saying. Good things in life are by me. So everything that I have is owed me. This is where pride goes. I am owed this. I deserve this. Pride looks at life. And says, life owes me this. I've worked hard. Everything that I have, I've worked harder than other people. I've even been more ethical than others. I I have really worked. I deserve this. This is what the king is saying. I did this. For me, I did this. It's why Tim Keller says pride is a form of cosmic plagiarism. See, pride says, I did this. I deserve this. The human heart is such that we think we deserve more. 
Nebuchadnezzar, you see, was this giant tree. Everything came up under the tree, in the shade of the tree. Pride says, I should be given more. He had it all. But humility, as we'll discover here, says, no, 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 life is a gift. Everything is a gift. I don't deserve anything. In fact, here's what a lot of people don't understand about Christians. A lot of Christians don't understand this. A lot of Christ followers, you know, here's the truth. I'm the chief of sinners, what Paul said. I'm the worst. I don't deserve anything in life. And a lot of people look at that and say, that's horrible. That's a terrible way to live. You would hate your life. That's no, that's not the case. Everything in life is a gift. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is that I am, am undeserving of anything. And yet he loves me unconditionally. This is the gospel. Humility receives all of life as a gift. That's why in James chapter 1, every good and perfect gift, right? Every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. See, the Bible teaches that all of life is a gift. Do you recognize that today? But it goes a step further. Even the challenges of our lives are gifts from God. You see, I've seen a, a, a false humility as well. I was sharing Christ with a young man, and, and I got to the end, and I said, you know, he's tracking with me, he understands the gospel, and I said, okay, do you want to receive Christ now? You could have this. And he says, no. I was really surprised, like, what? wait, what? why not? He said, because I, I just don't deserve this. I don't deserve it. I can't receive it. I don't deserve it. Listen, do you see that? That's a reversal. That's a reverse pride. You're saying that you, oh, so then you can't deserve it. If I can't deserve it, I don't want it. If I can't do what it takes to achieve it, I don't want it. That's pride. You see, you, see, you will determine your own salvation, is what this young man is saying. Some of us live our lives that way. We won't receive the good gifts of God. I don't deserve it, but pride, look at this. Pride says, look what I've built. Look for my glory. Don't I deserve this? This is like saying, you know, someone uh, brings in a piece of art. And then I step over and say, hey, uh, this is my painting. The artist comes in and says, that's not your painting. I did this. Or a great piece of music that I claim to have written. Or I write a, you know, somebody else writes a book. And I say, this is my book. No, that's plagiarism. That You didn't do that. The, the art is owned by the artist, right? The, the author owns the work. The composer owns the music. Listen, God owns he owns everything that there is. He owns you. He owns me. He owns it all. See, if you see life as a gift, you'll be humble and you'll live with gratitude and joy. See, instead, many of us live as if this is mine, right? All is mine. Now, that's, that's normal if you're like two years old, all right? But as you grow up, you determine that nothing I have is mine. Think about it. Think about it. What is it that you have is actually your doing? Uh, it, it, you, 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 weren't, you didn't decide when you were born. You didn't decide what color of the skin you would have. You didn't, you didn't determine who your parents would be, what, what period of time you were born, you know, when you were born or how. Or you, you did none of this. And so then what we do, though, we say, this is my life. This is my body. I will determine how to use my time. I'll determine what to do with my body. I'll, I'll use my body any way I want to. See, that's pride. God has given us our lives. And yet many of us still, we say, but Jeff, you don't understand. I've worked hard. With what? With all that God has given you. Nothing in life has come to us except that it's a gift from God Almighty. It's why in 1 Corinthians 4, it says this. It's how we ought to serve and see each other. It says, don't take pride in one person over another. It says this, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive as a gift? If, if then you have received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? That is to say, why do you act like anything that you have is something that you've done? Like you deserved it. This is the reality of pride. Let's look now at the result of pride. Verse 31. While the king is still proclaiming how great he is, there fell a voice from heaven. The kingdom has departed from you. Okay, if you think it's for you and by you, then the kingdom is taken away from you. You're going to be driven out into the field. You're going to eat grass like an ox. Verse 32, look at this. Until you know 
that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven out from among men, so he's isolated, and he ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird claws. What is going on here? This is crazy. Again, he essentially has a mental breakdown. Now, maybe you know that Howard Hughes, the great recluse billionaire at the end of his life, said they, they said that he had like corkscrew long fingernails, his hair growing, innumerable body, uh, I mean, uh, marks um, through his drug addiction on his arms. A, a, a recluse billionaire who self-destructed. This is what's happening with Nebuchadnezzar here. What we see here, listen, this is, this is what's going on. Pride defaces our humanity. Pride turns us into an animal. Pride disfigures our humanity. That's what's happening. He, God is saying to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says to us, because you insisted on becoming more than a man, you're just a man, no more. Because you've insisted on becoming more of a man, I will make you less than a man. Because you've sought to be more than a woman, seeking to be God of your own life, I'm going to make you less than a woman. You are where you need to be before a holy God. See, this is the natural consequence of sin, of pride. You will be humbled, but watch this. Being humbled requires that you be humiliated. Now, none of us want to walk through this. But by His mercy, God says, I need to save you from further consequences. Pride turns us into an animal. You're unable to love people as you should. You can't empathize with others. Your life is driven by instincts, if you will. It's all about the survival of the fittest. You live like an animal. You gotta be at the top of the food chain. You can't love others. Pride says, hey, what about me? You see, how will everybody around me help me? Are you living your life that way these days? How will you enhance my life? How do you see relationships that you're in? Maybe even your own marriage is like that or friendships that you have. See, pride comes into a room and says, here I am. Humility walks into a room and says, there you are. I see you. You see, pride says, hey, listen to me. Humility says, I understand. Tell me more. You see, these are radically different ways to live. Pride makes you want to stay away from anything that makes you small. See, this is why many of us run from, from people or places where we feel threatened. We may not recognize it as pride, but it's that. We, we, we run from things that make us threatened so that we're not you know, at the top of the food chain. We're not the center of it all. Pride makes us critical of other people. Pride says, uh, why is that person taking center stage? I should have that, right? Pride makes us want to tear other people down. I always told my kids this all the time. When some kid would say something ugly about them, they're just trying to break you down because they, wanna, they want you to be at their level. Pride makes you self-absorbed, and self-absorbed people are miserable people. I've never met a prideful, happy person. So that begs the question, if you're unhappy, is it because you're prideful? Now, this may sound like a harsh question to someone who's sad. But listen, some people are sad because they think they deserve more than they're getting. That's pride. Many people are sad because they think others are standing in the way of what they want to get. That's pride. Some of us have achieved much and we're sad because we're not getting enough credit for it. That's pride. Some people have received great gifts, and yet we're still sad because the gifts have terminated on us. We're no longer uh, a conduit of God's blessing to others. So it terminates on us. And worst of all, here's what happened. Pride fogs our spiritual vision. It's why C.S. Lewis said this, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see anything that is above you. Pride sucks joy out of your life. If things are going well, you say, well, it's about time. I deserve this. 
If things aren't going well and they're going badly, you're saying, I deserve better than this. Pride makes us become like animals. And the risk of pride is this. You may lose it all. Uh, I deserve that job. I'm going to quit this company. I'm not getting a raise. I'm out. I, I, I deserve that, that, that better position. I'm, I'm done. I deserve more applause. I quit. I deserve a better spouse. I'm out. You see, pride causes us to lose it all. I, de- I deserve more peace of mind. I'm going to medicate this challenge that I have. I'm going to escape. I'm going to buy more. I deserve better. There's only one way out, friends. We- we've seen the reality of pride. We've seen now the result of pride. It turns us into an animal. Now let's look at, as we close, the, res- the rescue from pride. All right? The only, only cure to pride is true humility, but this is a process again. We can't just hit a switch. I've learned this in my own personal life. You can't just hit a switch and say, oh good, I'm not prideful anymore. Uh, what, what, where's that switch? What do I pull? What do I do? To get to this point, it requires a humiliation. See, pride first acknowledges the fact that there is a cosmic plagiarism going on. It's all the way back to the garden. Adam and Eve decided we're not content with who we are. We're going to become God. We, we deserve more. Uh, we're going to take that place. Humility comes in, you see, and says, I deserve nothing. Uh, we're all fallen, depraved, and unworthy of God's grace. But don't miss this. The way out of pride is not painless. It's not easy for us. So I want us, before we close, I really want you to think about your life and come before him with humility There's an incredible image in the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, It's in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Maybe you've read the story. It's the boy Eustace. He goes into a cave and he finds himself, he he lays down beside a dragon. And then he he awakes and he has become a dragon. Now this little boy is prideful. He's self-centered. He goes along this, this dragon and he becomes a dragon. All right, so watch this. He becomes like an animal. And he wants to be a boy again. He wants to be undragoned. And so he's, he's trying to take the scales off. He's, he's all scaled and he's trying to take them off. And he realizes the more he, he takes off the scales, there are levels and levels of scales and he can't get them off. And then Aslan, who is the Christ figure in the story, comes in and, and, and he, he's going to help uh, descale him. But you may know that, that Aslan is a lion. So he takes his claws and he starts to tear the scales off of useless. And, Eust- and Eustace says that it hurts so bad. He thought his claw was going to go all the way to his heart. He thought it was going to kill him. Friends, this is the process of God stripping away our pride. The only cure to pride is humility, but humility comes only through humiliation. Seeing ourselves as sinners in need of grace and that everything we have in life is a gift. Sometimes we need to lose everything to realize that God is enough. Sometimes we have to be taken down until we acknowledge that the Most High God does whatever He pleases. Humility comes only when we see life as a gift. Everything in life is a gift. And that leads us to a constant state of praise. Gratitude is the cure in the end. And none of this happens without a radical change of the heart. Because, you see, if my goal is to try to achieve this on my own, uh, that'll just lead to pride. Whatever gains I make, I'm more moral than other people, that just leads to pride. You see how religion is not the answer. Uh, and, and then even if I do achieve something, I, I, I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm, I'm just prideful over other people. And so, you see, it requires that I enter into this deep relationship with the Lord Jesus, so that he might use my life, that I would become an instrument in the hands of God, an instrument of truth and of peace. In fact, I love what it says in Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. God desires to use your life. Jesus shows us the way. From the very top, the highest place. He comes all the way down to where we are, it says in Philippians 2. 
We, we noted that Jesus showed us the most powerful man in the room washes the disciples' feet. The most powerful, highest, the one with the most and greatest, how about all authority, gives himself away to all who are lesser than him. Humility is the way of Jesus, and it's the way to life. Nebuchadnezzar is finally restored, and he says at the end here, verse 34, the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. In verse 35, he says, he does whatever he wants to do. Nobody can come to God and say, what have you done? He says, my reason returned to me, got his kingdom back, his leadership back, and still more was added to his greatness. In verse 37, he closes with this. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And listen to this. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Friends, he will humble every one of us. Nebuchadnezzar receives grace because of his humility and his entire life is changed before he dies. Listen, before you die, now is the time. Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So as we close our time here, I want you to humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up and not until you do. Because this is the gospel, friends, listen. You and I are more sinful than we've ever imagined we are. We're more depraved than we can ever know. And yet at the same time, we're more loved than we've ever hoped for. This is the love of God for you. Jesus died on the cross, again, from the very top all the way down. He took on our shame. He was humiliated on the cross for us, stripped and beaten and died so that you and I could be lifted up if we humble ourselves before him and give our lives to him, the one true God. So I want us to close in prayer. Just bow your head right where you are. Close your eyes with me. This, I believe, an eternal moment for all of us here. A moment where our lives can be changed forever. So just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross that you took on our humiliation. You took on our shame upon yourself so that we wouldn't have to. You died in our place so that we can have life. Friend, with your eyes closed, your head bowed, if you've never received Jesus, now is the moment that you lay down your pride and you give your life to Him. Lord, we thank You for Your redeeming love that has come and rescued us from our sin. We give You our lives in response as an act of praise every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So friends, this is the reality of pride. All of us wrestle with it. The result of pride, it'll take you down. You become like an animal. The rescue of pride is only found in Jesus. And if you've prayed that prayer, if you'd like some help or want to know more, we'd love for you to text that, 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 uh, that word Jesus, the name. You'll see the text Jesus right there, the number. You can do that now because we would love to help you. We'd love to serve you any way that we can. And so now we can all praise the Lord because of his great love for us. So as we do, we're gonna close with a song together. So let's sing it out to him. As you give your life to him, just come to him. We can come to him just as we are. That's the beauty of his grace. Just as I am, I come to him. But now proclaim, you're not the king. He's the king. So make him, allow him to be king of your heart as we sing to him.